Thank you all so much. Friends, welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this lovely Sunday. We've got a few announcements to start off with. Um, and also, if you would take a moment to sign the friendship pad at the end of the pew. And during our uh, passing of the peace, if you see somebody you don't know or happen to have forgotten their name, please take some time and go do that. Kind of uh, sit in that uncomfortable situation for a little bit. Yeah, and we want to note the board in the narthex, uh, just inviting uh, everyone to the second semester of Parker Lucas's um, art and well-being workshop. There are some cues that the uh, we we got the word that the QR code did not work last week. It's been updated and should work well now. We're trying to welcome about 12 people to yeah. be a part of that group, and we figure we need to get out about 50 invitations. So if you know interested people in art and well-being, we hope you'll help us extend that opportunity. Yes, and also in the same vein, the art show, um, all of the art is actually due this coming, I think it's tomorrow, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have anything that's late submission or anything like that, just... Feel free to pop by the church tomorrow um, during our open business hours, and we'll be glad to catch it. And also, um, we have our First Presbyterian news page. That's on page seven. It looks like this. It's very lovely. It's uh, newly designed by Shane. And um, yeah, I think we've got Youth Sunday rehearsal coming up. That's right. So many wonderful things. There's an invitation to sit with Beth Olson, who is working on having meaningful conversations with adults regarding sex and sexuality with young people. Uh, we know that Waco uh, experiences a lot of real challenges around this subject, and that event is detailed. It is an event for adults. Uh, grandparents, parents, um, anyone who might be interested in talking about and learning about this really important topic for our young people, so we want to lift that up. Today's flowers are given by Sarah Preddy, and uh, she would like uh, members of the congregation to just take a rose or a flower or a small bunch of the flowers and take them home. If you're so inclined to that, you can meet in chapel parlor immediately following the worship service. And um, Scott Wagner has said he'll help us get these plants um, to the chapel parlor and you can wrap them up in a paper towel and take them home and enjoy them. So lots of gratitude to Sarah Preddy. Yeah. We've got a, a congregation full of folks who are actively praying for and thinking about one another. Sue Young and Joe Sutterth have now moved into that mysterious season of grief and reorientation. We are remembering folks in the middle of life transitions. Adam Redmer's going through this. We're remembering people that are post-surgical. Sharon Stern had an uh, operation on her neck this week that went very well and is successful. We're remembering those that are hospitalized, um, Mark Heron and Diane Tisdale. Um, we're remembering just a few names for the many people that you bring with you in your own heart and mind who are navigating change and uncertainty. And we arrive to the font because it's an anchor for us. It is also a buoyancy. It's the source of our comfort and our call, and we use it to welcome one another, saying with one voice, wherever we are, welcome home, children of God.
Please rise up in body or in spirit for the call to worship for this morning, joining our voices in the brick and mortar and across the Zoom room. Throughout history, the people of God experience closeness and distance from their creator. We can feel this in our own lives. Times of stability, strength, and joy are often aligned with God's presence. In times of exile, the people's voice rises up. We are called to worship, to engage God in the conversation of faith in all the ways. Let us worship God as we sing, pray, listen, and use and acknowledge. seated. <clears throat> Today, like most weeks, we practice an age-old tradition of confession, but I, I want to do something new. I want, it to, I want to make it newer. We talk about it as lasting age to age, but what about here and now? We get to do something new and different. New people are in the room there's diversity in the unity. There's diversity in our community. I was kind of surprised that rhymed. But will you join me now in our prayer of confession? <clears throat> o oh God, of the still small voice, 
We confess the temptation to exile you to the compartments of our brain. When questions of wonder or doubt unwrap beautiful but simple explanations, we are left holding the wrapping and the question. Attempting to be good stewards, we straighten and fold the wrapping, exiling you with it to a compartment of heart and brain for safekeeping. When new experience displace prior understandings of how you work, we scramble to gather our memories of the past and exile you with them into compartments that threaten to become haunting tombs. Here, nestled in community, we reconnect with the longing to ask the questions of faith. Where, how, when, why? Here, we long to reconnect with our courage within an opportunity, safe place. We long not to exile you, but to engage you in faithful debate. Or we long to expand rather than compartmentalize the regions of heart and mind. Lord of life, your name outshines, and yet we long for a measure of understanding in and through Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear this good news spoken to each one of you this morning, that even when it doesn't make sense, even when it might feel just too good to be true, um, even when you might not feel it in a particular moment, that God loves you and God is with you. And so take these things for the road. Take mercy, take justice, compassion, companionship, so that we might continue on the way and rise and share a sign of peace with one another, saying the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. Grace and peace to all. Peace of Christ to everyone. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. Good morning. Peace of Christ. Good morning. Peace of Christ. <laughs> You may be seated. Chris, when do you want to do the presentation? Oh, we did yeah. that before. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh, totally. yep. Y'all, um, 
Where's Gabby Wagner? <laughs> All right, so we're going to um, celebrate. Often celebrations can also feel uh, like embarrassments at the same time, because some of us don't like to get up and be recognized for things. Um, Gabby just might fall into that camp, I don't know. Um, but we do want to recognize her. So Gabby, would you mind coming up here for one moment? So Gabby is a daughter of this church, um, and she has recently uh, completed a course here. One of the things that we are very uh, just proud of and also passionate about is the interplay between faith and science um, and the ways that those two things can actually create the two very important parts of our lives. Um, and so Gabby, we wanted to celebrate you and give you a certificate of completion because she spent the month of January going through a course all about science, faith, prayer, mindfulness, um, and we just want to celebrate you and the person that you are. So can we just give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> Thanks. Chris, thank you so much. And want to invite the Ferreter girls and any Thanks. children present in the sanctuary forward for the spirit box. Beside me, Christ within me, Christ in the face of those who love me. So sadly, was that okay, Lucy? So I took So it's okay. Would you like me to Yeah. Okay. So I didn't take a sneak peek, but I'm going to enjoy what's in here, particularly because of the look in your eye. I see here we have a squishy pink donut. I mean, it is right next to the communion bread, the favored piece of Sunday morning digestion. A black cat, a very small black cat, very small. A very beautiful piece of purple quartz. I mean, look at that. That kind of looks like your dress, May. That's beautiful. And then, most beautiful of all, a shell. Did this come from a special place? Did it? Where did it come from? The beach. The beach in Germany? No. Oh. The beach here? The beach in California? It's from where? Galveston. From, from Galveston. So it's our own beach. How many of you have been to the beach? Parker, have you been to the beach? You know, I grew up by the beach. Okay, so what's it like to stand on the edge of a beach? Hmm, what do y'all think it's like? It's basically like where you are, you, you, you um, get to enjoy the waves, and, and sometimes I even went boarding with a boogie board. So you get to enjoy the waves and the boogie board. What else do you... Can you stand up with me for a minute? Let's just stand up and pretend that our toes are at the edge of the water. You ready? Lola, you want to come on up? You guys want to stand with me? Come on. Yeah. We're going to put our toes on the very edge of the water. Here comes, here comes the wave. Here comes the wave. Oh, don't let it get your toes wet. I can feel the sand being washed away underneath my feet. Okay, the wave's going back. We'll come back up, get our toes wet. Does anyone want the water to wash over your feet? Okay, let's stay here. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Can you feel it? Woo! 
And there are things that wash up around our feet. What could wash up around our feet, Lucy? Shells. Shells or beautiful rocks. If it's really scary, we might get a black cat that washes up. If a donut washes up, you should not eat it. <laughs> what, is the, what is the important thing about waves? Yeah. Yeah, there's kind of a motion that keeps the water really full of life and full of, you know, um, possibilities. If these animals in the water didn't live, then they'd probably die. Yeah, what happens if there's no life in the water? Yeah, if there's no life in the water, we also would die. We really depend on the water to be healthy and well, right? And a healthy body and a healthy um, hydration. Do you know that word? A healthy hydration means that I can eat a donut and I can be okay if I'm already healthy. I get to have a little fun, right? What a wonderful spirit box. Parker, anything that you want to say about a black cat? Oh, about the black cat? Yeah. I always thought it was unlucky, but I, th I think as, as we're talking about it in the midst of waves and stuff like that. Like your black cat, it might leave for the day, but it always comes back. Oh, nice. Night. I like that. Yeah. That's really just nice. Just ebbing and flowing. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Maybe the whole family, Maybe the whole family what? We'll come to join. Say it one more time. We'll come to join. We'll come to join the whole family of black cats. This is a whole nother sermon, JJ. Let's say our prayer. God be in my head. God be in my heart. God be on my left. God be on my right. God be beneath me. God be above me. God be in the faces of all who love me. Thanks for a wonderful spirit box, babe. I'm worried about the shell getting broken. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Well, friends, there is an old saying that those who can't do, teach. Um, and I want to submit to you this morning that that is a lie, okay? Um, John Jovicich, you might know him, um, he is one of our choral scholars. And not only uh, does John have a magnificent voice and supports us in so many ways up here on a Sunday morning, but John also teaches some of our young folk about percussion. Um, and, go. Uh, and about music in general. I was seeing some familiar faces as they're leaving. Oh, they're, they're gone now. But um, yeah, we, uh, we played percussion on Children's Sunday back in November. Um, and it's a very good tool to start teaching music, start teaching how to get familiar with instruments and familiar with music in general, the notes and how to read it and everything. Um, we played Go Tell It on the Mountain back in November, and then after that, we did some hymn singing, um, Silent Night and Jingle Bells for Christmas, and currently, we're learning notes and rhythms so that we can start working on some new, um, some new music uh, coming up for Easter. And so it's really important that we have a lot of members so that we have a full choir whenever we start performing. And I look forward to teaching um, some more. So yeah, that's what we've been doing. That's what we're currently doing. And the plan going forward is to get some hymns under wraps and performed for Easter. So thank you all. John, thank you so much. We do want to take a minute to offer a word of prayer as we get ready to dive into the book of Job. Let us pray. Gracious God, of each and every heartbeat, of each and every breath, we are your people and we settle in humbly that we may be sufficiently open, that we may be sufficiently perceptive, that in the speaking and the hearing, there may be particular ways we can live out your word in our lives. So be with us and allow the Spirit to envelop us. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. 
It's an unusual moment of scripture where uh, Job has been arguing with God, and um, this is some of the oldest literature in the Bible, and it really imagines the way that a man like Job argues with God, and God asserts back, and then Job sort of says, oh, my bad. And God says, no, you need to bring it. And that's what this text is this morning from the 40th chapter. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. Then Job answered the Lord, Ah, oh, see, I'm of little account. What shall I answer to you? I'm going to actually lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once, but I'll not answer twice. I'll proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Gird up your loins like a man. I'm going to question you, and you will declare to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like this? And then a most unusual set of instructions from God to Job. Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor, Job. Pour out the overflowing of your anger and look at all of those who are proud and abase them. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in all the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Friends, will you rise in body or in spirit for our gospel reading? Today's gospel reading comes from John 14, verses 25 through 31. Listen now for the word of the Lord. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all what I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let, me, let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you will rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. This is the gospel of our Lord. very symbolic where the one pastor draws power from another. Thank you. I said, for those in the Zoom room, I said it's very symbolic when one pastor draws power from another. I want to thank Chris Palmer for his batteries. <clears throat> It's very counterintuitive what I want to assert this morning, which of all the exiles that we have examined in this sermon series, the exile uh, narrative of the Garden of Eden, the exile of the Israelites by the Assyrian Empire and by the Babylonian Empire, the exile that is anticipated from John 14 where Jesus is going to leave his disciples. Of all these exiles, I believe that our attention is drawn to the issue of exile because the, the entity that is most threatened by exile is God. And that you and I have the power we have the ability to make that exile happen. I think scriptures return to the, to the subject of exile and returns from exile is meant to imprint on your brain and on my brain that exile is a situation that anyone longs to return from. The human being is really a fascinating creature. We have the ability with our brain to compartmentalize our thoughts, 
to tuck things into compartments where they can be suffered or to tuck things in to compartments that can be lauded. Any human being sitting in a pew sits on a lot. Any human being sitting in a pew sits on a lot. The book of Job is the oldest piece of literature in our Bible. And it has been said of Job that he was very patient, but the evidence of the book is that he was not. That he argued with his friends and he argued with God about the loss of his happy state. And the book is book-ended. Job is happy. That is, Job is in an advantageous situation. That's the entomology of happy. Job is in an advantageous situation at the beginning of the book, and Job is in an advantageous situation at the end. And the symbol for the advantageous situation is that you got lots of kids and you got lots of resources. But of course, what the text is trying to tell us is that Job is sitting advantageously. But for 30 chapters, which makes the book impossibly boorish to read, Job just argues with his friends, friends who provide mainstream explanations about why people lose their advantageous situation and suffer. The friends offer mainstream explanations and Job says, that ain't me. I'm better than that. You've got it wrong. And the friends are saying, dude, just humble yourself. Get yourself in a right posture. God won't be offended and you'll feel advantageous again. And Job just can't take the disingenuous posture. He just can't do it. Because if there is anything like having an advantageous situation and losing it, it is that you are coming to terms with your assumptions about what gives rise to the preferable life. Job is sitting on, his, on a lot. His friends want him to sit on it and keep his mouth shut. But Job works Job's insistence and power on God right up into the 40th chapter where Job gets on the edge of where he wants to be. And maybe we have been there too. <laughs> he gets on the edge of where he wants to be and God says, what do you have to say? And Job says, oh my gosh, I, I'm out. I'm not going to keep this argument going. I don't know a whole lot. To which God says, would you provoke the questions of my essence and then stop engaging me? You will not. You'll gird up your loins like a man. Claim your power to judge the people around you, to lay the mighty low, to assess your circumstances. God in the book of Job says, claim your power. Everybody sitting in a pew sits on a lot because the longer we live, the more questions we have. And the script of the church has been that if you come here, you will get answers. That's been the script. And it hasn't been a malice, malicious script. It's been meant to try to offer some comfort, try to offer some resolution. But the book of Job says, if you have an advantageous situation and you are happy and you lose it. The only way you return to an advantageous situation is to examine 
is to examine the life you have lost. And so Job has to examine the assumptions that because he's played by the rules, he's going to get rewarded. Job has to examine the assumption that wealth and children mean you are blessed by God. And we watch Job move through the agony, and then we watch Job rise up almost eye to eye with the creator in the narrative, in the whirlwind, in the intensity. And Job's going to go on a ride with God that examines all of creation, the wonder of it, the mystery of it, the ferocity of it. Anybody sitting in a pew sits on a lot because the longer we live, the more questions we have. And the questions are usually related to the answers we got served. This is at great risk to my own job security. I want to remind you that really in your heart of hearts, you don't need answers. In your heart of heart, you human beings do not need answers served up to you. Though it is a worthy effort on this church or any church's part to offer up some examples of the answers. But in your heart of heart, you don't need answers. You need tools to live with the questions. The reason it's important to offer up preliminary answers is so that you can work with those, so that you can wrestle with them, so that you can consider them, and so that you can, when the time is right, discard them with some courage. Because there is no life that anybody's living except the life that you are living. No one's done it before. No one will do it again. There is no generalized or, the book of Job means to say, there is no generalized or mainstream answer that will solve the suffering and uncertainty in your own life. It is only the persistent, the persistent work of the human being that says, I will not sit on my questions, I will air them. I will not sit on my questions, I will air them. And I will air them from my power and my agency and my ability. And I will not exile God, I will engage God. You see, when we sit on it, and we let an assumption live longer than it should, you know, and some assumptions live so long that they just begin to smell ripe. They're just terrible. Now, what I mean to say is, now here's the move that sometimes happens. People get a number of answers from churches. They sit on suffering and uncertainty and questions and whatnot, and they don't air them. And they finally say to the church, I've had it with you and your answers. And when they do that, when they do that, it is a, I want to say, it's a devastating move. The church can certainly be scapegoated for simple answers, but it misses the nuance of the point of having provided the answers that it is each and every human being's responsibility to work those answers over, to deal with the assumptions that get challenged and broken and give rise to suffering in our lives, it is our job, as it was Job's job, to move beyond the mainstream explanations and engage. And it is a very legitimate prayer to say, what the hell, God? 
It is a very legitimate prayer to let anger and uncertainty rise up within us so that we can engage. By the end of the book of Job, Job's friends are suffering. One can assume from their mainstream answers. And God asks Job to remember God's friends. Let me close with two examples of the way that I think we generally sit on assumptions. Because the Christian tradition makes two important declarations to you and to me. One is that God is present. And the other is that we are all the time going to God. And one day we will experience an arrival. On the one hand, Christianity asserts God is with you all the time. And on the other hand, God, Christianity asserts we are all the time going to God and we will someday arrive. And I don't know a human being that hasn't sat on some real questions about whether or not God is present and whether or not we're going and will arrive. And it's the extent to which you and I air these questions in small groups and Christian formation classes and around our kitchen tables, it's the extent to which we exercise and use flawed language and ask ourselves and those we trust the questions that we are equipped to help prevent other people in the faith from sitting on it, from sitting on too much, from working over the suffering of life in order to arrive not at answers but important questions. Given that I have gone through this, what is it that is being asked of me? The number one complaint of people outside the church is that the church language asks them to sit on too much of their own experience. And when I read that in the literature, I want to say, oh my gosh, you've got to come to First Presbyterian and sit in Charlotte Henderson's Sunday school class and talk to Bob Lott and visit with David Gray and just, you know... Lorraine Dupuy will teach you how to wrestle. Come on. Of all the exiles from the garden, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Jesus' exit from the world, the most profound exile is to sit in the pew and sit on a lot and exile God because we can't bear to share it or to ask the question. But God says, ladies and gentlemen, gird up your loins. Because no one else will work over your questions if you do not. And if you do not, you will have nothing meaningful to share. I once knew a woman who brought a cushion with her to church. And she would put her purse on the pew and she'd put the cushion down and then she'd, she'd get over the cushion. And she'd sit down. And when she got up, she'd bang that cushion on the side of the pew. Isn't that a great image? Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for the singing of our hymn. Oh, thanks.
Friends, would you remain standing as we say together our affirmation of faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, saints. the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for this morning's offering. You may be seated. Would you please join me in prayer? Father, Mother, Creator God, we breathe in this moment and fill our lungs with your loving presence. We bring our attention to our beating hearts and remember that you are our sustainer. We take a moment to consider our rumbling stomachs and express gratitude for the way you satiate us. We wiggle our fingers and our toes and trust the way your spirit moves us. We come to you fully human, fully alive, and fully grateful to be your creation. It is in the acceptance of our humanity that we also accept our inherent goodness, a goodness that prompts us to open our hearts even when they are broken, a goodness that encourages us to move our bodies even when they are riddled with grief a goodness that keeps us curious about how we might heal and experience more of you. As we take our final breaths in this moment and prepare to take on the moments outside of this sanctuary, help us to remember that we are the sanctuary, that our bodies are the holy facilitators of your sacraments designed to bring us back to you. And as our savior, redeemer, and sustainer taught us, we boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Before the, before the charge, Chris, I got asked kind of an awkward question at the end of the last service. Okay. Shane Montoya, who's an adult, 
asked if he could have one of the spirit boxes. And I really don't know how to answer that, so I'm just going to phone a friend. Is it ringing? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Hey, Phil, it's Leslie, and we're all getting ready for the benediction at church. Uh, Shane Montoya asked if he could have one of your spirit boxes, and he's not a kid. What should I do? What do you think? All right, uh, you wanna hang around for the benediction? Okay. Uh, he says, if it helps your daily devotion and prayer life, please take one. Oh, wow, there you go. Please, please come claim your spirit box. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are charged to help us remember that we are all children. We are all children of God. Friends, I invite you all to stay if you are comfortable for some food and goodies as we live out Michelle's uh, promise that God is the one who satiates us. Um, and so come and be filled. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Okay, bye. <laughs>